It is good to be together this morning, and I hope all of you have the elements for the Lord's Supper already with you today, either from home or from the table in the entryway. John will be leading us in the prayers for the Lord's Supper right after our study this morning, and then Clayton will be leading us in three songs before we head outside to do our visiting outdoors. As our tradition has been, we're explaining God's plan of salvation here at the beginning. The gospel is the good news about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. This is what God has done. And in response, we must believe this good news and obey it. We trust and obey, for there's no other way, as we sometimes sing. So we turn away from sin, we confess Jesus as being the Christ, the Son of God, and then we allow ourselves to be buried with Christ in baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And at that point, God adds us to his kingdom, the church, and the Christian life begins. If you have any questions about this, we'd invite you to get in touch, uh, talk to me, talk to John after service, and we'd love to study with you. And as our tradition has also been, we're passing along some good news today. The first pictures here are of three women baptized in Kenya last Sunday, Irene, Betty, and Nancy. And so we rejoice with our new Christian sisters this week. And then we also have an update from the Gospel of Christ, which is an online teaching ministry based out of Manchester, Tennessee. Uh, recently, Glenn Burkhard there on the left started watching down in the Huntsville, Alabama area. And he then went and found a nearby congregation in Hazel Green, Alabama. He then made that call, studied with their preacher, Ben Bailey, and Glenn was baptized just a few days ago. So we're thankful for those good opportunities online to learn about the Lord and his church. And we're thankful for Glenn's persistence in following up with that and studying the Bible down there. And then we also have a picture of Jameer. He was baptized last Sunday at the Roser Road Congregation down in Phoenix, Arizona. And this is all I know, uh, but we do know that we have a new Christian brother. And so we rejoice with Jameer and his new Christian family down in Arizona this week. And we share all of this as we have the last year by way of encouragement. What these men and women have done over the last week, you can do this morning. And we'd love to help you with that. If you have any questions, talk to me or to John on your way out today. And we'd love to get together to study. This morning, I would invite you to return with me to 1 Corinthians 15. So if you have a Bible, it'd be good to be turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Several months ago, one of our members was asking for a lesson on a rather difficult verse in this chapter. And we finally get to that verse today. Uh, normally, before we would ever study a verse like 1 Corinthians 15, 29, we would really need to spend half of our time together giving some background information before we even get to that passage. But we've already had three weeks of background material now. And so of all people, we now know what this chapter is all about. So that should make it easier for us to understand. As we've been learning, this chapter is perhaps one of the first written accounts of the Lord's resurrection, written even before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, like Madison, we learn that Corinth is also built on an isthmus. And we learn that Paul visits Corinth on his second missionary journey in Acts chapter 18. The church there has some issues, and so Paul writes a series of letters addressing those concerns. And in 1 Corinthians 15, he comes to the resurrection. And it seems, in fact, that some of the members of the congregation are perhaps questioning the possibility of a future resurrection. So three weeks ago then, we started in the first 11 verses. Paul starts to combat this teaching by appealing to the resurrection of Christ. He starts with what they already believe. If you are a Christian, you believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And so he starts there, appealing to the existence of the Christian faith, appealing to the scriptures, appealing to a good number of eyewitnesses. And then he applies all of that by writing about the change that the resurrection makes in our lives. Two weeks ago, we moved into the next paragraph. We came to a new line of reasoning as Paul encourages these people to imagine what life would be like if Christ had never been raised. So if the dead simply do not come back from the dead, that also applies to Jesus. And Paul points out there are some consequences to that. Our preaching is vain. Your faith is vain. All the apostles are liars. Uh, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Those who have died are truly dead in every possible way. They are not coming back ever. And then finally, we of all people are most to be pitied as Christians we have sacrificed everything for nothing, and that makes no sense whatsoever. We have wasted our lives. So last week, we came to verses 20 through 28, as Paul gives the reminder that Christ has been raised from the dead. And because of this, we learned that we will rise, death will die, and God will reign. Well, today we move into verses 29 through 34 of 1 Corinthians 15, and we find today that the resurrection is something of a motivation. And without the resurrection, the greatest incentive for Christian living is taken away. 
And so without the resurrection, what is the point? The resurrection motivates. And if we're weak or struggling with our faith, there's a good chance we need to think more carefully about the resurrection. And so today we're looking at our response to the resurrection. Uh, some of these are worded in a negative way, as Paul first puts it, without the resurrection, we wouldn't be motivated to do this or that. But for the purpose of our study, I want to look at these things in a positive way. Because of the resurrection, this is what we're motivated to do. This is how we respond to it. So because Christ was raised, because we will be raised at some point, we're motivated to do something. So this morning we're looking at verses 29 through 34, and as we look through these verses, we're looking out for how we might be motivated to respond. So 29 through 34, the words of Paul, uh, he's in the middle of claiming that Christ really has been raised, and we pick up with verse 29 as he says this. Otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? Why are we also in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minder as you ought, and stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. As we look at what Paul says here, let's go back and notice what the resurrection motivates us to do. And I want us to start in verse 29 as Paul mentions baptism. And this is where we get to this strange reference to those who are baptized for the dead. And one of our members wants to know, what in the world does that mean? And as I've tried to process this passage over the past 30 years, I think I've preached on it twice, once in Janesville, once here about 15 years ago. And here's my conclusion. I am not exactly sure. And if you have any idea, if you figured it out, I hope you'll share it with me because this is a difficult passage. Uh, but this is what we do know. Paul knew exactly what he wrote when he wrote it. The Christians in Corinth knew what he meant when he wrote it. But for us, though, it seems to me as if something is missing. We're missing some context. And there's, there's something that's not there that we kind of want to know, but we don't have it here. Unfortunately, some in the religious world today have taken this rather obscure passage, and they have done some very bizarre things with it. Uh, most of us know that the Mormons literally baptize for the dead. They will research genealogies and somebody in the present will be baptized on behalf of someone who has died in the past with the idea that one person can be baptized on behalf of another. And some of you may understand this is why the Mormon church has such an interest in genealogies. Uh, Ancestry.com, for example, is Mormon owned. And so if I have any question about my dead ancestors, I wanna know who my great, 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 great grandpa who is, uh, they know. I don't know that, but they know that. You know, they have these huge stockpiles of records and they know it goes back to this passage. They have a religious motivation to find the names and the dates of everybody who has ever lived so that they can be baptized on their behalf. Uh, as you can imagine, they've had some controversy in the fairly recent past as Mormons have supposedly been baptized by proxy on behalf of people like Adolf Hitler and Genghis Khan and Joseph Stalin and many, 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 many others. And so as we try to figure this out without losing our minds or spending the next six months on this, here's what's been helpful to me. We know what this passage does not teach. We have several possibilities as to what this passage might teach. And then finally, without even nailing down every possibility, we can be very confident in what we need to learn from this passage. So first of all, what does this passage definitely not teach? Well, when we compare everything else the New Testament teaches on baptism, we know that Paul is not suggesting that the living can be baptized on behalf of or in the place of those who are already dead. Baptism is not some kind of magic ritual that one person can do for another. This isn't voodoo where we push a pin in a doll and somebody else gets hurt. That's not what baptism is. We don't immerse one person and another person gets saved because of it. That's not what baptism is. 
baptism is our personal obedience to the gospel. And so we personally hear the good news, we turn away from sin, we believe what we've heard, we confess Jesus as being the Son of God, and we allow ourselves to be immersed. We personally are born into God's family. There is no way to do this for somebody else any more than I can repent for somebody else, any more than I can believe for somebody else. Plus, another thing to consider here, once this life is over, that's it. There are no second chances. According to Jesus in Luke 16, there is a great chasm between the saved and the lost. After death comes judgment, according to Hebrews 9.27. So this verse does not teach that somebody can be baptized in order to save somebody else who's already died. That would contradict with so much else of what the Bible teaches on this. Well, what might this passage teach? What are some possibilities? We do have several. First of all, there's a chance that Paul is referring to some form of what I just referred to, but he's not endorsing it. And I hope this makes sense. There's a chance that he's taking what others are doing and he's using it against them. And so in that sense, what he's saying can be true. So if the living are being baptized on behalf of the dead, it's wrong, and he doesn't address the wrongness of it here, but he's saying that it makes even less sense or it makes no sense whatsoever without the resurrection. And I'll say the, the main thing going for this view is Paul's shift in pronouns. You may notice reading back through this chapter up to this point, he's been referring to I and you and we. But notice suddenly in verse 29, he says, otherwise, what will those do? who are baptized for the dead. If the dead are not raised at all, then why are they baptized for them? So I just want to point out, this is not something Paul is necessarily endorsing, but he's saying it's something that they do. He's using this in his argument. It may be similar to the argument Jesus makes in Matthew 12, 27, when he speaks to the Pharisees and he says, if I by Beelzebul cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. So Jesus wasn't saying that he was casting out demons by Beelzebul, but he was using their argument against them. And so this is at least a possibility. Another possibility is that some were being baptized in order to be with their dead relatives. In other words, my grandfather died. He was a faithful Christian. I want to be with him. Therefore, I will be baptized. And so in a sense, I have been baptized for the dead. So that's one possibility. That's one way of looking at this passage. A slightly related possibility is that some were being baptized as a result of the influence of somebody who has died. In other words, my grandmother was a faithful Christian and she has now died. But when I think of her example, that motivates me to obey the gospel. And so in a sense, I have been baptized for the dead. As I studied for this lesson, I realized in doing a number of hours of reading, that many of the authors I was reading had already died. In Hebrews 11:4, the author refers to the faith of Abel and says that the, through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. And we learn from that when we die, our influence lives on, even to the point that we might motivate somebody to obey the gospel, to be baptized for the dead. Uh, most of the songs in our songbooks these days, are the authors are probably already dead, but we continue to be influenced by them. I realized something last night as I was printing the bulletin, the article on the front page of today's bulletin is written by a friend of mine who died a couple years ago, Stan Mitchell, a Bible professor down at Freed Hardeman University. And so if you read the article in today's bulletin and were influenced by it, in a sense, you have been influenced by the dead. Somebody who is now dead is influencing us to live the Christian life in a better way. And so in that sense, we might be influenced by those who are, who are dead. We might be influenced to obey the gospel. Another possibility some have brought up here is that some might be baptized in order to fill the vacancies left by those who died. And it's almost the picture of an army in battle. As some are killed on the battlefield, others step up to take their place. And so that is one possibility that's been brought up here. Filling the ranks as we continue pressing on in the Christian faith is another way of looking at that. Another possibility is that some were baptized due to the influence of Paul and the other apostles. And this is interesting. Uh, just a couple verses after this, if you look at verse 31, Paul refers to himself and he says, I die daily. So in a sense, Paul was 
a dead one. Um, he was living as if he was dead. He was referring to his suffering as an apostle. In 1 Corinthians 4.9, he refers to himself as one condemned to death. In 2 Corinthians 4.11, he refers to constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake. And so because Paul and the other apostles are so willing to die for what they believe, others were looking at that and they were saying, there's something in that and I need to pay attention to it. And so perhaps that is how they were being motivated to um, obey the gospel. So some then were perhaps influenced by the dead apostles, even though they weren't dead yet, they were living as if they were. So we know what this verse does not teach. It does not teach proxy baptism. We've looked at what it might teach, but what do we know for sure? In the big picture, we need to realize Paul is writing these words, not primarily to make a point about baptism. This isn't a chapter about baptism. This is a chapter about the resurrection. So his main point in the big picture is about the resurrection. Without the resurrection, baptism makes no sense at all. But as we turn this around, the positive side of this is that the resurrection in some way motivates us to be baptized. We might not understand every possibility here, uh, but we know that 1 Corinthians 15, 29 teaches that the resurrection in some way motivates us to be baptized. Without the resurrection, baptism makes no sense at all. So we might not understand everything about this, uh, but we can still get something out of it. We know what it doesn't teach, we know what it might teach, uh, but ultimately we know it's tied to baptism. So this leads us to a second motivation provided by the resurrection. The motivation to risk it all, to live in danger for Jesus. That's the best thing I could say to summarize that. That's a little strange, but uh, that seems to be what Paul is saying here. I love how Eugene Peterson paraphrases this passage in the message. He summarizes what Paul is saying here in these words. And why do you think I keep risking my neck in this dangerous work? I look death in the face practically every day I live. Do you think I'd do this if I wasn't convinced of your resurrection and mine as guaranteed by the resurrected Messiah Jesus? Do you think I was just trying to act heroic when I fought the wild beast at Ephesus, hoping it wouldn't be me or wouldn't be the end of me? Not on your life. It's resurrection, resurrection, always resurrection that undergirds what I do and say the way I live. It's not a translation. It's his opinion of what this passage means. It's his way of summarizing it in his own words, a, a paraphrase. And so it's the hope of resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus and our own, that motivates us to risk everything for the Lord. We live in a world that hates us as Christians. Like if they really knew what we believed, we are so different. Uh, we live in a world that hates us so much, they crucified the Lord. And so it would be very easy for us to kind of keep quiet about what we believe and what we understand the scriptures to teach and just kind of go off and hide somewhere. Sometimes that's a little bit tempting to go live in the mountains away from everybody and nobody will, just everybody leave me alone. But the resurrection motivates us to live dangerously, to put our necks out there, to put ourselves at risk and do bold things in the name of Christ. Several days ago, a headline from the Babylon Bee caught my eye. They're, they are a site for satire. I know some of you are very familiar with them. Uh, they're like the onion for Christianity and uh, the onion being, you know, starting here in Madison and all that. But uh, in light of it being Pride Month, uh, this is what the headline said. Major corporations bravely come out in support of incredibly popular socially acceptable movement an interesting headline there and so now it is brave to boldly agree with what everybody else in the world already agrees with and you read through the article and the article closes with this line meanwhile companies that openly support incredibly unpopular religious causes were booed for their cowardice very interesting to think about that for a little bit as God's people we look at the world around us and we mourn the terrible things that are happening in the world. We think we're unique. We think, wow, the world is worse than it's ever been. And yet that's not really the case. Uh, the world is being the world. The world crucified Jesus. And if we're his people, it's been risky to live for Jesus. And the resurrection is our motivation. And anything that we suffer in this life is worth it. That seems to be Paul's point here. Notice in verse 30, Paul wants to know, without the resurrection, why are we also in danger every hour? So Paul was in constant danger. At the end of verse 31, he says, I die daily. As I see it, Paul would wake up every morning fully expecting to give his life that day for the preaching of the gospel. He would wake up, this could be the day. This could be the day I'm going home because I'm preaching the gospel. I die daily. 
In verse 32, he refers to fighting with wild beasts in Ephesus. We don't have a record of Paul fighting wild beasts in Scripture. We do know that not long after he left Corinth, he was caught up in a riot in Ephesus. When the silversmiths guild uh, riles up the crowd over Paul preaching against the goddess Diana, he was cutting into their bottom line saying that she wasn't a real god, and he barely escapes with his life. He didn't have to say that, but he put his life on the line for the Lord. Uh, there might have been literal beasts involved, but it might have been figurative. Uh, today when we talk about throwing somebody under the bus, we're not literally throwing somebody under the bus. And that may be kind of what he's talking about here. I fought with wild beasts, not necessarily hand to hand with lions, um, but awful people were fighting Paul and uh, didn't want him to succeed. So either way, Paul faces each day with courage uh, despite living in constant danger. As far as the danger Paul was facing, I'll just read a paragraph from 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 28. He's defending his apostleship. Some people were saying, you're not a real apostle. And he comes back with this. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so, in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from, from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. So Paul then faces what he faces on a daily basis with courage and he's motivated by the resurrection. Otherwise, what does it profit me? As he says back in verse 32, if there's no resurrection, why do I put myself through this? Without the resurrection, why bother? Without the resurrection, there's no motive for sacrifice, no reason to risk everything. And the positive side of this, of course, is the resurrection motivates us to live for Jesus no matter what, uh, risking everything, living dangerously for the Lord, we might say. In light of the resurrection, we as God's people need to look for ways to put ourselves out there. This is something I'm uncomfortable doing, but it's the right thing to do, so I'm going to do it anyway. And that seems to be what he's talking about here. So it, it motivates us to be baptized. The resurrection motivates us to live in danger for the Lord. And this leads us to the third motivation in this passage. Because of the resurrection, we have a reason to live with sobriety. And we see this starting near the end of verse 32 through the end of verse 34. And there are a number of ways we might summarize this. But the idea is the resurrection motivates us to live the way Christians need to be living. There's a lot in those verses, but that seems to be it. He starts with something of a negative argument, and he seems to quote a pagan playwright, which is interesting. Non-Christians are sometimes quoted in the Bible. Um, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Um, and so if the dead are not raised, that's a valid conclusion. Um, if the dead are not raised, who cares how we live? I'm thinking of a situation a number of years ago when a man in England was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And if you're familiar with that disease, it's quick and um, very, very fatal. But his doctor told him he would be dead within a year. And so this man went out, he quit his job. He started selling or giving away all of his earthly possessions. He stopped paying his mortgage. And then he started spending his savings. Went out with friends, took expensive vacations, did everything he'd always wanted to do. And at the end of that year, he had nothing left except for the suit that he wanted to be buried in. But as that year came to a close, his doctor made a discovery. The man didn't have pancreatic cancer at all. His uh, pancreas was inflamed. So it was serious. It was painful. And it mimicked the symptoms of pancreatic cancer. Uh, but the last I heard, he was suing the doctor. So kind of strange there, isn't it? Um, to be suing your doctor for ultimately giving you the best news of your life. Um, but anyway, thinking he was on his way out at any moment, he enjoyed himself right up to the, what he thought was the very end and ended up in poverty. That's what Paul is saying here. If there's no resurrection, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Uh, let's just live like we want to live. Um, but because there is a resurrection, the opposite of true. So let us not be eating and drinking with the idea, let's not be partying. Let's not be living like there's no tomorrow because there is a tomorrow and there's a life after this one. Um, and this is where we come to a verse that's often ripped out of context. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. 
and I've seen a lot of sermons through the years that are only on this verse, not looking at anything before it or after it, and it, I think they kind of do damage to the scripture, but uh, that little statement is true in many ways. I think most of us have done some things with friends that we would have never considered doing on our own. Um, I'm thinking of an area-wide church fellowship at the church down in Crystal Lake on a Monday night many years ago. Uh, the churches in the Chicago area, like on the one Monday of a month, would get together for preaching and some eating. Um, the church sign at that time in front of the Crystal Lake Church building was a bit like ours here. Two signs kind of pointing toward the street at an angle. Only theirs were four by eight sheets of plywood, so it was a lot bigger on the big road there. And my friend and I went out there at night when everybody else was eating inside. And we hid between the boards of that sign. And we threw a few jelly donuts at some passing cars. It was a lot of fun to do that with a friend uh, at night uh, until we hit a car and the guy screeched to a stop in the middle of the road and jumped out of his car and chased us all the way through the church property and behind the church building into the field behind it by the train tracks. And he finally caught us and we never ever did that again. And uh, today I'm embarrassed by that. I have matured through the years. Um, today I would never, ever waste a jelly donut like that. Um, but my point in sharing this is neither one of us would have ever done that on our own. Me sitting at home alone at night, I would have never thought, hey, let's go throw donuts at cars. All right? But the two of us got together and you think of some amazing things when you're together with friends. And so we influenced each other in a bad way. And that's the point Paul was making here specifically with reference to the resurrection. Some in the church at Corinth, not in the world, in the church, were denying the resurrection. And that teaching was starting to take hold and spread. Uh, back in verse 12, Paul was asking, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Some among you, some in the church were saying this. And uh, that teaching was starting to impact the way these people were living. So what we believe influences what we do. And the people we associate with influence what we believe. And so that idea is be careful who you associate with. If the people I hang out with think it's okay to waste donuts like that, uh, get some new friends. You know, you need to be with a different crowd. And, um, and so that's what we believe about the resurrection controls how we live. It controls how we spend our time and resources and it changes our behavior. So no wonder then the church in Corinth had so many problems. We read through this book and it's awful. We think there are some terrible things going on here. Uh, up to this point in the book, Paul had dealt with division. Everybody in the church had their favorite preacher and they were all gathering around there. Like, this is my preacher. I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas and so on. And so they were dividing over that. He's dealt with a man uh, living in sexual sin with his own stepmother. Yeah, that's disgusting, right? And he says in 1 Corinthians 5, not even the pagans do that kind of thing that you people are doing here in the church. Uh, he's dealt in chapter 11 with the wealthy members chowing down on the Lord's Supper and emptying the table and not leaving any for the poor members. And we think that is awful, absolutely awful. But a lot of that traces back to their misunderstanding about the resurrection. When we leave behind the basics of the Christian faith, we drift and we sin and we do terrible things in other areas. If we don't believe right, we're not going to behave right. And if we don't believe the resurrection, everything else is out the window. Uh, Paul's conclusion comes in the command in verse 34 to become sober minded as you ought and stop sinning for some have no knowledge of God. Wake up from your drunken stupor. That's the way the English Standard Version puts it. When you're drunk, you cannot judge your behavior properly. It'd be like asking a drunk guy how he thought his driving has been lately. Oh, I'm fine. I'm a great driver when I'm drunk. Uh, but that's the idea here. So he says, become sober-minded as you ought. You need to sober up and then figure out the Christian life. You gotta start with the basics. So that doesn't mean we can't enjoy life. As Christians, we do enjoy life, uh, but we do need to go through life sober-minded, knowing that we're gonna be held accountable someday. There's a judgment coming. There is a life after this one. So is there a resurrection? Absolutely, there is. Jesus really did come back from the dead. And because he was raised, we will be raised. This motivates us, first of all, to obey the gospel, to be baptized, to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. The resurrection also motivates us to live for Jesus. 
risking everything, risking embarrassment, risking financial ruin, even risking our lives because we know that in the end, anything that we sacrifice will be worth it. And then finally, the resurrection also motivates us to live righteously and godly in this present age. Because Jesus has been raised, because we're going to be raised, we have to stop sinning and we have to live lives of sobriety. I'm thankful for the request. I know that's a strange verse, hard to understand, but I think we've learned some things from it. I'm looking forward to coming back together next week to look at the next paragraph and we'll continue to learn more, more about the resurrection. Uh, before we partake of the Lord's Supper, let's close this part of the service by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the one and only great and awesome God, creator of heaven and earth, the creator of life itself, and the God of both the living and the dead. As we think about the resurrection, we ask that our thoughts would be shaped by your word and that our hearts would be encouraged to always do what's right. We pray that your son's resurrection would encourage us to be more like him every day, loving our neighbors, caring for the poor, speaking the truth. We pray that we would wake up, that we would always be sober-minded and ready for your son's return at any moment. Thank you for forgiving our sins. Thank you for Jesus. And thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Each Lord's Day, we have the opportunity to partake of this memorial to Christ's death on the cross. It reminds us to examine ourselves. It reminds us to live like Christ each day. With that in mind, let's go to God in prayer. Our glorious God and Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather around this table and partake of this memorial to, to your son's death. We pray, dear Father, that as we take of this bread we will remember his body that was nailed to the cross for our sins we pray father that we will reflect on this and that we will live daily as a better sacrifice to you that others can see christ living in us it's in christ's name we pray amen, amen. Our loving and merciful Father in heaven, as we continue our thanks to you, we thank you for this fruit of the vine. It reminds us of Christ's blood that was shed on the cross as the only perfect and lasting purchase price for our sins. Help us to remember the price that was paid and help us to live according to your will each day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, let's sing. Good morning. Trouble sometimes I hear filling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we all give, now it's at stake. Humbling your heart to God, stay to the chastening rod. Sink the way pilgrims drop, Christians awake. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet there. Trumpets will sound. All of the dead shall rise. Righteous feet in the skies. Going where no one dies. 
when we meet on that shore, free from all care.
Yes, we'll gather at the river.